fate, Scott. Are you a sports fan who loves to have a good laugh? Oh, yeah. And you're in the right place. I'm going to make him an offer again. Life moves pretty fast. The Patriots win the Welcome Super Bowl. to the Man Cave Chronicles. Welcome to another episode of the Man Cave Chronicles podcast, the podcast of talk culture where everyone has a story. I am your host, Elias, and you can find me on Twitter at the MCC Podcast. My guest this week, you've seen him as Captain David Singh on The Flash. You've seen him on Homeland as Rita Hashim, Patrick Sabogi. Patrick, welcome to the cave. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. What's new with you, man? Uh, what's new? I'm still uh, still out there doing my thing, uh, working on as many projects as I can, still auditioning. Uh, I, uh, I got a new show uh, coming out on CBS uh, in a few months called Blood and Treasure. Uh, it's kind of an Indiana Jones, Romancing the Stone situation for TV. Okay. Uh, so keep him busy. You know, I'm doing okay. Yeah. And you're still... Uh... On Flash, also. Yep. Yeah. Still, uh, still on Flash. Still captain of the CCPD. It's been a busy season for me, actually. I know. Uh, uh, I mean, I can't reveal too much about what's going on this season, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's been a fun one. Yeah. So I want the listeners to get a little bit more, a little bit more about you. Uh, so where are you originally from? I'm from Montreal, Canada. Uh, I'm a first generation Canadian. Uh, my parents uh, moved over from Egypt uh, just before I was born, uh, and I traveled a lot as a as a youngster. Uh, but Montreal is home. Yeah. So how uh, how was it growing up there as a kid? Uh, what were you into? I was into Public Enemy, uh, the Denver Broncos, and the Oakland Raiders. <laughs> so you're a football fan. <laughs> Huge football fan, man. Yeah. yeah. Do you, uh, Which is funny growing up growing up in Montreal because it's all hockey all the time. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I was always a bit of a rebel. So I never played hockey, always played football. Um, yeah, that was my that was my thing. I was the rebel. Are you uh, are you a fan of the Canadian Football League? I am. I'm, I'm a supporter of the CFL. I have to be honest. You know, in terms of. Uh, my enjoyment of the game, I, I grew up on NCAA football, uh, you know, Michigan, Notre Dame, uh, and, and the NFL. So if I had to list them in order, CFL is, you know, yeah. got to take third place. But I, I'm a big supporter of the league, and I think, I think football's got a, a long way to go in Canada, and uh, especially the fans can do a lot more in terms of supporting the game. I think we need an extra down, a smaller ball. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm still a supporter you, of the CFL. Do you hope someday uh, maybe the NFL will uh, have a team out there? I was thinking about that. Uh, I I think it might be interesting. I don't know what city it, it would end up being. Toronto, yeah, I guess because the NFL just the numbers, the numbers you need. You know, I mean, we don't have the population concentration in Canada to support that kind of those kind of contracts just to be competitive in the NFL. Yeah. Um, I think it would be amazing. Um, I, I think the CFL could also take steps to make the game a little bit more competitive. Yeah, now, That's more likely than us getting a whole NFL franchise. I have to ask, since you're from Montreal, uh, what do you think of uh, a baseball team coming back? You know, like I th- From who have I talked to from Canada, they, they missed the Expos. Oh, man. I, some of my fondest memories as a kid were at Expos games. And... I don't know what it is in the fashion world, though, or maybe I've just been lucky, but I keep seeing these Expos caps popping yeah. up everywhere. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else has noticed that, but, and they're like, style, they're not just the, the red, blue, and white, like when I was growing up, but like I've seen some slick black ones and black and gold and like all, and I don't know why that's out in the ether, but I would love to see a Major League Baseball team back in Montreal. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of people would like to see that. I know a lot of like Red Sox fans would travel to Montreal to see the Red Sox play Montreal when the interleague was going on. Hey, that was some of my favorite, um, you know, yeah. drunken brawls down in <laughs> downtown Montreal yeah. when I was young. Were you know uh, Boston fans coming up for Expos games or Bruins fans coming up for yeah. Habs games? Yeah. 
<laughs> I uh, I actually had some friends that went when we were younger. I mean, I'm 40 years old now, but when we were younger. Uh, I had two friends that went to see. Actually, they were there for something else, and one of them had a Bruins jacket on, and he pretty much had to take it off when he was walking down the street because he was getting harassed. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that. Yeah, that was the thing. I, I mean, whether you were a hockey fan or not, uh, Bruins fans were like, it was open season on Bruins fans at all times in Montreal. Yeah. I'm not a supporter of violence, and I don't think that has a place. But I appreciate competitiveness. Yeah. But I mean, that's just how fans get sometimes, right? Especially with the Habs in Montreal. Yeah. So, I, you know, I did a little research on you. Uh, so you have background in martial arts. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of followed my brothers to Kung Fu class when I was young. Uh, I have three older brothers and I take a lot of my cues from them. Um, I think my parents put me in karate when I was really young. So it made sense to me, but I wasn't really feeling karate. Uh, I remember just thinking it was too strict and linear. Uh, and then my uh, eldest brother and then my other two brothers ended up taking Kung Fu at some point. And uh, I remember following them to class and it was Hungar Kung Fu, which is uh, the five, you know, animal styles. And uh, I just loved it. It was expressive and uh, it was dynamic and it just made sense to me, man. And uh, I never, I never looked back. And in, in fact, I kind of, uh, I took my inspiration from that and, uh, and, and I feel like in a way that led me into the acting career okay. because acting for me was physical and it was performative and it was expressive and coming from the Hungar school, you learn, you know, it's, you're not just, the, the movements don't just, uh, have animal nicknames. It's the movements have evolved out of mimicking animals. And so they take on the characteristics and so the, Sifu would encourage you to, you know, make the sounds and feel and embody the animal in that movement, the tiger, the snake, the crane. And I don't know, I responded to that and I enjoyed that. I thought that was fun. And so when I stumbled upon acting, I was like, oh, this is just an extension of that. Were you a, were you a fan of like martial arts movies growing up? Oh, man. I must have seen Bloodsport over 130 <laughs> times. I think that's like one, yeah. of my, one of my favorite Van Damme movies is Bloodsport. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Have you seen uh, the, the new Van Damme show? The one that was on uh, uh, Amazon? Yes. I did not watch that, but I already heard he got canceled. Oh, uh, well, yeah. I mean, it was amazing for the season that it was. I don't know how much further you can go with that show, but if yeah. you were a Van Damme fan growing up, I wish I could remember the show. Van Dam something, yeah. Um, but it's amazing because he's very self-aware, yeah. you know, very self-aware as a performer, and he puts all of that into that show. It's hilarious. Yeah, and the good thing about Bloodsport is, uh, uh, it was a true story too. Oh yeah, Frank yeah. Dukes, man. Yeah, yeah. And and what it did, and I think why it touched a lot of young martial artists is because it showcased a lot of traditional styles from a lot of different places, yeah. and it showcased them in a pretty authentic way. I mean, you, you know, you can look back on it and, and say the acting was cheesy, but, uh, you know, Forrest Whitaker is an Oscar winner, and he's in that, so it can't be that bad. Yeah. Um, but as far as martial arts go, they showcase a lot of different styles. Yeah. I mean, for um, it might be cheesy like now, but, but, but for back then, you know, it was those were great films for us to watch. Yeah, I think they were still a little cheesy, though. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Did I, you, but I appreciate it. Yeah. Were you a fan of Kickboxer? <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. One and two. Yeah. And actually, actually, my boy, Ale Moussi, who is a stunt guy and now an actor from Ottawa, but came up in the stunt industry in Montreal, uh, has kind of inherited that, um, that Van Damme lineage. Okay. So I'm still a big supporter and big fan of, and he's inherited that franchise. Wow. Uh, he was Van Damme's double for a while, uh, but he's come into his own, and he's the, he's the man now. I let me see. So what? So what attracted you to acting? How did you get into it? Um, I always, I always felt it would be something that I would be good at uh, in high school. I was, I was taking dance classes. I was more of like a, you know, I was doing dance and I was DJing and I was hosting the school talent shows. And I think in the back of my mind, I always knew being in front of people 
and uh, entertaining people and bringing people together in that sense was something I was comfortable with. Um, and at one point, um, I realized that acting was a way to connect to more aspects of life than I would be able to in any other career. I love life. I love the world. I love people. And I love different cultures and learning about different professions and different geographical areas. And acting to me was the most immediate way to be exposed to and to experience as much of the world as this life has to offer. And so the combination of those things, wanting to experience as much of life as I could and enjoying and being comfortable in front of people and bringing people together, I, I kind of just had this feeling in the back of my mind that acting would be something that made sense for me. Yeah. Did, um, so how did you, like, you said you got into acting, but you've also done producing, you've done a director, you've also, I noticed mm -hmm. that you're a teacher and a stuntman. I mean, that's a lot of things to, mm -hmm. to tackle. Is it, though? I, I mean... It sounds like it, but to me, it's it's all the same thing. Yeah. It's all storytelling. Okay. It's all storytelling, and it's all learning about this specific, you know, a story is, is a specific set of circumstances and a specific set of characters and relationship dynamics. And yeah. I've spent my life studying that, yeah. studying people and studying relationships and story. Um, you know, I've been I was in theater school for a very long time so coming out and, and I was always physical and so I was able to connect physically to characters and so being a stunt guy to me was just an extension of storytelling in the theater I kind of come out of the theater tradition and in the theater you're playing Hamlet or Laertes or you know you're playing Tybalt uh, when the sword fight starts you don't drop your sword, run off stage and let your stunt double come out and pick up your sword and do the thing. Yeah. You have to learn that set of skills. So uh, even being a stunt guy, to me, is an extension of storytelling and an extension of embodying a character. And uh, producing, directing, uh, you know, I'm, I'm writing more now. Uh, all of those things to me are just... Uh, me bringing myself to the story and bringing it to life as best I can. If I can visualize how to direct a thing or shoot the thing or bring pe the right people together to tell the story more effectively, to me, it's really just an extension of the same thing. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you do your own stunts now? Uh, I, I think uh, that's such a, I'm aware of how tricky a question that is in this day and age. Yeah. Um, I'm going I'm to put it like this. I think every actor that says they do their own stunts is telling the truth. I think every actor does a version of their own stunts. Okay. Some more so than others. Some do a more stunty version than others. Uh, not everybody is Tom Cruise. I'm going to say it right now. He's legit. Like he could be a stunt guy if he wanted to. He spent his life training and, and, and you know, production facilitates him really doing the, you know, ultimate version of that sequence. Yeah. Uh, but not every actor is like that, you know. Some actors are very physical and they can do a very effective version of their own stunt. But I am not going to take away anything from career stunt people. Yeah. They're some of the most incredible human beings on the planet. They're the closest thing we have in the real world to superheroes. Every fantasy of superheroes that we see actualized on screen is because of stunt people, performers and stunt coordinators. Uh, so yes, I do a version of my own stunts and I have done stunts for other actors and I have done exclusively stunt sequences. Uh, but when I'm playing the character, it's not always to the production's best interest for me to, be the guy doing the stunt also i'll do a version and i'll sell out and i'll go as hard and as fast and you know as big as i can yeah. but if they have it budgeted to bring in a stunt person that day a i'm not going to take a day of work away from a legitimate stunt person and b uh they're going to do a version of it that might be even more extreme than what i can do that day because i've got other story things to worry yeah. about so yeah i do a version of my own stunts yeah. but i'm not taking it away that there are other stunt people on set that day also do an aversion. So, um, so what was your first audition and how did it go? 
<laughs> really? Uh, damn. Um, well, I came out of theater, and so I, I assume you mean in, in film and TV and something people can pull up and watch and see how horrible it went. Um, my first gig in film and television was a stunt actor gig, so there was no audition involved. Uh, it was on a show called Largo Winch, and it was there was it was a fight scene with the two leads, uh, and my best friend Kevin Kelsall, who's a very accomplished stunt performer and fight coordinator now out in Montreal. We got cast together as Thug Number One and Thug Number Two. This was my first gig in in you know on camera, uh, and it was a fight scene with their two leads. Kevin got beaten up with two uh, baguettes. Uh, as in the French bread baguettes, uh, he got beat up and I got beat up with milk. The, I spent the day in the hot sun in Montreal in summer with milk being poured all over me uh, and milk splashing and him slapping me and all this like ridiculous fighting stuff covered in milk. And it, I don't know if you ever, you know, left a glass of milk out in the sun all day, but by the end of the day, it is ripe, dude. <laughs> it is not fresh. And uh, that was me. At the end of, by the end of the day, standing in the hot sun, fighting in milk all day was so nasty. Um, that was the real stunt. It was just, <laughs> it was just it was surviving that stench of the hot milk. Yeah. Um, so that was my first on-camera gig. Okay. Um, uh, but my first audition was for, uh, for a show uh, starring Matthew Mordine. Um, and it was set in a prison. I can't remember the name of the show and the audition went fine, but I, I honestly, I got on set and, uh, the nerves took over and I just, I was too big, too broad, too loud. I didn't understand the filmmaking process and I was in and out of the character in and out of the accent that I was using. Um, and it was a bit of a train wreck, man. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was my first, uh, you know, auditioning and acting on set are kind of two different skill sets. Yeah. And I had gotten the audition thing down and I was still figuring out how to act out loud on set. How did you audition for The Flash? Uh, for The Flash? I was here in Vancouver and it was okay. a straight up, straight up audition. It was, uh, I, you know, I didn't know anybody. I didn't have that high of a profile. Nobody was coming to look for me. Uh, it was straight up email from my agent. Hey, there's this new show based on the comic book. Uh, here's the audition. Here's the sides. Your audition time is, you know, X, Y, Z. And uh, uh, actually, I, I couldn't make it to the audition time. I can't remember why, but I uh, put my audition on tape. Uh, my wife is an actor. Uh, she's an incredible actor. She's an incredible acting coach and acting teacher. And she coached me up uh, on, on this audition. Her name is Kira Zagorski, by the way. She coached me up on the audition. And we sent a tape. Uh, and based on that tape, I got a call back. Uh, and I just went and fought for the role. Yeah. And, uh, you know, did as much research as I could. I was a bit of a comic book fan growing up. So I had a recollection of, of the character. Because when I was growing up, uh, you know, as a Middle Eastern guy uh, growing up in Montreal, uh, you know, I was aware of my ethnicity. And looking at comic books, there weren't that many people of color. There weren't that many people who looked like me in comic books. Yeah. And so I had this vague recollection of David Singh and Captain David Singh in the comic books. Uh, and the Flash comic books has this, you know, person of color. And he was the you know, captain of the police. Or in the comic books, I think he's... Uh, he's uh, um, what is he? He's not a captain, but he's detected or something like that, depending on the iteration and yeah. which series. But so I looked him up again, refreshed my memory. And I remember my daughter at the time, she was very young sitting in my lap and I was scrolling through pictures of captain David Singh from the comic books. And she must've been six or seven. And she said, daddy, that's a comic picture of you, but um, your hair is different. <laughs> So even even her, you know, looking at these pictures, yeah. I saw me in the character, and I was like, oh, I got this, man. I got this. This is in the bag. 
Uh, and so I went in and fought for it and won it. Yeah. How did you prepare for like a role like that? Like, uh, you know, like playing an, uh, an officer pretty much. Um, well, I think, you know, in the scenes that I got, there was some procedural stuff, some police officer stuff, but really what I wanted to connect to was his anger. Captain Singh is just, he's an angry dude, you know? And I was trying to figure out how do I get to that angry police captain place, but, but retain like his humanity. So my preparation was in trying to understand what somebody with that much responsibility is going through. Uh, like if you imagine you're responsible for the safety of the city, but you know, there's dudes with like freezing, you know, guns that freeze things and flamethrowers and people with superpowers. And there's already the stress of trying to keep central city safe. But on top of that, you've got the supernatural stuff happening that you have no control over, no understanding of. So what I was trying to connect to with Singh was that sense of stress, that sense of man, Everything in my life gives me a headache. So when Barry comes into my office or Joe West comes into my office and whatever it is they have to say is going to be annoying and give me a headache at yeah. this point because <laughs> everything is spinning out of control. Yeah. So the preparation was really emotional rather than procedural. Do you have a favorite scene or a moment that you've been in in the show? Oof. Oh, a favorite scene or moment. I don't know. There have been so many, so many little quick, uh, quick moments. I, I really look. I love all of my stuff with with Jesse Martin uh, and with Grant Gustin and all of the Joe Barry and Sing stuff. It feels like home. Yeah. You know, it feels like we have this amazing working relationship. But I gotta say, I really enjoy getting out of the office. I really enjoy the opportunities Captain Singh has to. To be a to be a bit of a hero. Yeah. Oh, you know what? One of my favorite moments probably is is I don't know season two or three when uh, maybe even season one when Weather Wizard comes into the precinct and he's like pulling lightning in from outside and he's blasting people and there's wind and papers flying everywhere and he takes a shot at Joe West and I push I push Joe West out of the way and kind of sacrifice myself for him. Yeah. And I take this blast, and I get blasted across the room. Yeah. Um, that might be my favorite, my favorite moment. And getting back to your question of, you know, do I do my own stunts? I did that one. There was okay. no double that day. It was all me getting, you know, on a wire with, you know, wind fans blowing everywhere, and and me getting, you know, uh, ratcheted back into into the bookshelves. Yeah. Uh, that might be my favorite moment. But I also love the moments where Captain Singh gets to have moments with, you know, Cisco and with Iris and, um, you know, meet the rest of the team and interact with with the rest of the cast. Right. I love you, those moments, too. Now, you've made appearances also, like, on Supergirl and Arrow. Uh, that must be like a, you know, those, those when you get those phone calls that you're going to be on those shows, that must be fun, too, huh? Oh, absolutely. It's it's really exciting because I, and I, I admire... Uh, I, I really uh, appreciate that I get to do that. I, I know a lot of people, uh, a lot of actors get on shows and, you know, it's season five now and a lot of other actors get on one show and that's their job for five years, you know, and as actors, we're not really built that way. Actors are used to like, you do a play for eight weeks and you're out, like you're picking up a new story or you're auditioning, you know, for five different characters this week or you're on a show for, a couple of weeks and then boom, it's done. Or the film shoots for 30 days and you're done. You're onto something else. We're used to um, a lot of change. Uh, so I appreciate that a lot of other actors get on season five of the show and they're just on that same show every, you know, every episode or whatever. And that I get to, I get to venture out a little bit. Yeah. Where do you hope your character goes in the new season coming up? I know you can't reveal uh, a lot. Uh, no, but I can reveal what I hope. You know, because I think it's a lot of what the fans hope, um, and and this is not no indication, honestly, because I don't I don't know, uh, I don't really have that much insight aside from what we've already shot this season. But uh, you know, I hope like the fans that um, 
we get to see a little bit into Captain Singh's personal life. I really appreciate uh, how diverse of a character he is. I appreciate his personal relationship dynamics. He's DC Comics' first openly gay character, um, and CW has retained that, you know, characteristic. And they, you know, we've met his romantic interest, uh, you know, in previous seasons in the comic books. Uh, you know, he's in a in a kind of secret relationship with the Pied Piper, uh, with uh, you know Hartley Rathaway. We've met that character on the CW, but they've never really hinted at their relationship. Uh, there's plenty of time for that, plenty of room for that, but I think a lot of the fans are dying to see that, and that, I'm hoping that that gets explored at some point, yeah. for sure. Do you uh, did you enjoy your time on uh, on Homeland? Are you kidding me, man? <laughs> I know it's a did great, I enjoy- <laughs> great. It's a great show. <laughs> It's such a great show. Uh, it's there. Um, yeah, I'm super grateful that I got that opportunity. I think my wife actually tweeted out a picture. She was there the moment that I got that call uh, that I was going to be on Homeland. Uh, and I honestly, I couldn't stand up straight. I got weak in the knees that I had to squat down and hold my head. And I was yeah. like, oh, my God, is this really happening? Uh, because it's such an intelligent show and it responds to current events and uh, and I am in awe of the, the level of talent on that show uh, among the actors and the writers and the directors, the filmmaking, the storytelling, everything on that show is just so incredible. And so for me to get on there and to be able to you know move out to Brooklyn for six months and work in New York City, yeah. Uh, it was a dream come true. And then working with that cast and with those creatives was, it felt like leveling up. It felt like bringing every talent I had and every experience I had on set and bringing it to bear and trying to level up. Wow. So like in the acting world, like who are like some of your influences? My influences? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't know, man. To be honest, I never really saw myself when I was growing up. Uh, I knew there were other actors, there were actors that I admired. Yeah. You know, there were the De Niro's and Pacino's, uh, and, uh, Mark DeCasco's and Dean Cain's. Uh, out there that I felt uh, that inspired me, you know, and I know that that's a weird combination of dudes, uh, but Pacino and De Niro for obvious reasons, but Dean Cain and Mark DeCascos, it's because they're non-white actors, they're physical, uh, you know, they had higher education, they were a lot, a lot of, about their lives. Yeah. Uh, you know, Dean Cain was a football player, uh, uh, Mark Cascos is uh, a martial artist, uh, and they were these guys playing outside of their stereotypes uh, and having these careers. But I don't know that I modeled myself after anybody. I don't know that I saw myself up there on screen. There was no one actor that I was like, "Oh, I can have his career." Yeah. Um, but you know, there, those were some individuals that inspired me. Yeah. So you said you you know you do some teaching on the side. What is some advice that you give to somebody that comes up to you and says, you know, oh, I want to become an actor or a producer? Um, right now, I think the most important piece of advice that I can give young actors is know yourself. Figure out who you are in this world. Figure out what you believe in. I think the mistake young actors make is that they want to be seen they want to be good actors they want to you know they want to do a good job and do whatever it is the industry wants them to do so they can succeed but that's a pitfall it's a trap that's a trap because the industry doesn't want another carbon copy of every other actor that's come before you the industry wants unique voices they want artists and you can't be an artist until uh, an artist until you know who you are how you identify and then and then be that thing be who you are with confidence and um and study 
and train and get technical ability, get technical knowledge. Do a lot of acting. Do good acting, do bad acting, do stage, do a podcast, do uh, you know, a web series with your friends on your iPhones mm -hmm. and make it, just make things, do it as often as you can with as many different teachers as you can. And then the combination of having experience doing it and then knowing your unique voice as an artist uh, will make you an indispensable part of the industry. But just trying to do the right thing yeah. and just taking on camera classes and on camera auditions and agent workshops, that's not acting, man. That's not going to do it. It's not going to make you creative. It's not going to make you interesting. Yeah. It's going to make you a carbon copy of everything that's come before you. So if you, you know, you said you know, you're, you're in TV and you're, you're in film. If you weren't an actor or producer, what do you think you'd have been doing right now? Oh, wow. I would be, uh, what would I be doing? Um, maybe my football career would have gone further. Okay. Um, uh, I think at some point in my football career, I had to make a choice because I saw the guys who were going ahead of me and I thought, they love this. This, this is what they do. They play football, period. Yeah. They're athletes 24-7. I had too many distractions, too many interests outside of football. So if I, if I had never found acting, uh, you know, maybe I would have taken my athletic career a bit further. I think I still would have been an event organizer or um, some kind of producer. Okay. I think that was always my strength, you know, uh, on the student council or uh, as, a, as a party planner, as a DJ. Was, was bringing people together, organizing events, organizing parties. Uh, so something in that universe, I guess. Do you have a dream role that you hope you can play someday? Does it count if I feel like I've played it? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's... I, I've had a very blessed career. Mm -hmm. And in the past few years, you know, I've set goals for myself. And I've had these dreams of roles that I could play. And I... And I've gotten those opportunities. Yeah. I've gotten to, you know, play lead roles, opposite actors that I've admired for decades. Um, I did this film called Drone, opposite um, Sean Bean. Um, and it's basically a one-room drama about a family guy, uh, an Indo-Pakistani guy, whose family was killed by a drone operated by the CIA. Uh, and he comes to America and finds out who the drone pilot was that took out his family. And, uh, and that's where the drama plays out. And so that was, that was an intense lead role opposite an actor that I've admired since, since I can remember. Okay. Uh, that was a dream role. I, you know, I played on stage, I played um, Amir Kapoor in Disgrace by Yad Akhtar. That was a dream role on stage. Uh, on TV, you know, I've been, this is season five of The Flash, and I love the character of David Singh. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I was on Homeland playing I know. an yeah. advocate, yeah. For, you know, uh, playing Retta Hashim, who was, who, uh, was uh, a civil rights lawyer advocating for the rights of wrongly accused Muslim Americans. Yeah. That's, I couldn't have written a, a more perfect role for myself at that time with where my social conscience is and what I think the public discourse needs to be in society right now. Um, yeah, I, I, I kind of lived some of my dream roles. Yeah. So, you know, you've done a lot of interviews and you've done podcasts and everything. What is one question that you never get asked that you wish you got asked? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I got asked. Uh, I don't know, man. Uh, 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 nobody's ever asked me about my mountaineering experience <laughs> and my dreams and hopes. I, I, you know, I, I was always an outdoorsy guy and a rock climber and, and hiking and ice climbing and all that stuff. And I, I used to have these lofty aspirations as a mountaineer. Yeah. So nobody's ever asked me about that. Well, the next question that I have for you is actually, what is a fun fact about you that you want the listeners to know? Oh, well, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how fun I am, man. <laughs> um, but, 
Yeah, I guess. You got to have fun. I mean, you're working. I mean, you're you're a dad. How many kids do you have? Oh, yeah. I got two kids. Uh -huh. And they're amazing human beings, amazing individuals. Yeah. Honest, to be honest, they've given my life purpose. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how fun that is, but to me, that's fun. That's real. That's that's my life, man. Yeah. How, uh, how old there are There is they? no priority about that. Uh, my daughter is 13 okay. now. Wow. She's a teenager. Yeah, that's kind of trippy. Uh, and my son is 10. Okay. So they're, yeah, so they're older. My kids are young. That's why uh, I asked you how old oh, they are. Oh, are they? Yeah, I have a three-year-old daughter and a ten-month-old boy. Oh wow! Yeah, that's a it's a very similar age spread to, as my kids. Yeah, yeah. That that's awesome. Well, congratulations, man. Yeah, you have uh, you. you have uh, quite a few years of adventures ahead of you. Oh yeah. So, uh, lastly, uh, do you have any uh, upcoming? Pro I know you mentioned the project in the beginning of the podcast. Is there any other ones yeah. you want the fans to know about and to look out for? Um. What else is there? I mean, uh, you know, I stay busy, man, and I get on a lot of different projects. But, I mean, in terms of ones that I'm excited about, there's that, Blood and Treasure, coming out on CBS uh, sometime soon, probably in the next – it might be actually not till next summer. Okay. Uh, but they'll hear about it. That's kind of a big thing. Uh, and season five of The Flash. Yeah. Uh, other than that, you know, if I get any magical phone calls in the next 24 hours, uh, I'll let you know. <laughs> And uh, lastly, how can the listeners find you on social media? Uh, my handles on social media are just my name, Patrick Sabongi. I'm a creative guy, but I, I didn't really pick creative social media handles. Okay. So Instagram, Twitter, uh, all that, I'm uh, Patrick Sabongi. All right. Uh, I want to thank you for coming on. This was fun, man. Yeah, it was my pleasure, man. Thank you.